to another episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me, as always, is Mr. Chris Hellstrom. How are you today, Chris? I see you laughing over there. I am laughing because that, I, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm doing all right, man. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well as well. So I'm going to be a bit more chipper this week compared to last, I think. Oh, good. Yes. Well, chipper is good. Mm. I like chipper. Mm-hmm. What What are we talking about? And and bring the reasoning for that that odd introduction to this week. <laughs> pitch correcting vocals, of course. Yes. Obviously, pitch correction is, I would dare say that it's part of just about every track that we do these days. With Not vocals just or just I. instruments or everything? Well, certainly for vocals, I say. Mm-hmm. Unless you're dealing with certain genres where that would be sort of like blasphemy. For the majority of stuff, I think there's at least a certain level of vocal tuning going in. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. You could argue that that's kind of sad. It is. It's also just a tool that we have at our disposal. Let me ask you this question. Do you think this is a byproduct of just singers lacking, let's say, the ability or the willingness to work on the vocal? Or is it that the listening audience at this point have become sort of sensitive to vocals being in absolute pitch? I think it's a combination of both, actually. And what I mean by that is, is that the use of pitch correction software has possibly made old school singers a little bit more lazy. New school singers who don't know the difference absolutely have no concept of putting in hard work, generally speaking. And I'll back that up with this. I've worked with numerous vocalists who come out of a session with me saying it's the absolute hardest they've ever worked in the studio. Because you demand more takes or or to redo it or, or, yeah. I demand more takes is generally what it is. And the reason for that demand is, is I keep a checklist of the lyrics and I figure out which take has the best take for a phrase or a word or a syllable of that matter. And I learned that from our good friend, George, because he did that to me. And up Mm. until that point, I was kind of lazy. And the reason why I might have been kind of lazy was having lived with a famous rock singer who was able to nail takes and... One, two, three takes tops because <laughs> he's just that good. And yeah. it took me a while in recording myself over and over and over again to get to the point where I can do things in one, two, three takes tops. But working with somebody else, if they're listening and you're just doing the performance, it can take a lot more takes because the performance aspect of it changes. It can be harder for the performer to understand that if they're not fully aware of that. Pitch correction software tends to make that too easy. If you can get relatively close, it's easy to quote unquote fix, but that doesn't make it better. Working it makes it better. And if you are somebody who looks up to say the likes of Phineas, who is Billie Eilish's brother, his whole thing is she does hundreds of takes to get to the final takes that they use in their productions. And that's telling. She's got a work ethic that most people don't have. Because most people would be bored as shit after maybe the fourth or fifth take. Yeah, and I mean, in fairness, you also have to take into consideration a vocalist not being able to push their voice. Like, Well, yeah, it also point, depends right? that, yeah. Right. I think the tuning of vocals tends to be a very divisive issue because I think there are people, especially people that have been around for a while and they will just call bullshit on tuning vocals. Sure. Because I know, no, no, you just don't have the talent or you're just lazy and it's everything released after 84 is So there that is, far, though. No, 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 I, I don't agree with that. But it's a very similar mindset to guitar players just being super anti anything that is an amp sim. Mm-hmm. You know? I can see it both ways. I I mean, I I think it's always better to do another take if the singer can do it, right? As opposed to just like, ah, we'll just just fix it later. Fixing it is always a Band-Aid. It is a Band-Aid. And the idea of doing another take, if people understood what some classic albums took in terms of time, they'd freak because 
some of those albums that people revere in this still in this day and age, it took time because maybe the singer ran out of gas. Their voice started to give out. They had to wait a day and rest the voice and do new takes the following day or a couple of days later, or they got sick while they're in the studio. They ended up having to recoup until their voice was back to normal. Yeah, th there is and that. People and people are course... so impatient now. It's insane. Yeah, but, but you also got to couple that with like studio time because mm -hmm. studio time, unless you're doing it, you know, in your own place, then studio time is cheap. But if you're going somewhere and you have an engineer or, you know, a producer that's there dealing with it and the day rate is not cheap for the studio. So I think that's another thing that kind of plays into it where it's like, look, we just got to get this song down today. Mm. because we're not paying whatever. The good news is though that we have the tools. So whether somebody comes down on the side of like yay pro tuning or, or not, mm -hmm. well, it's, each is fine. It's, like the, it's the end product that really matters. Sure. But I guess also like the question that we should ask ourselves is like, should we tune everything? That's a personal question. And the answer to that for myself is I listen first. But I'm also willing to do multiple takes to get it to the point where I don't really need to use it personally as me as an artist. Yeah. And to that end, I'm always okay with taking an additional take. Now, I also have the luxury of having a studio at home. That makes it easier that if my voice is giving out or I'm not feeling it to get the emotion right, I can take time off. <laughs> And do yeah. it again later. <laughs> most people, and as you mentioned, most people may not have that luxury. However, if I were going into another person's studio or a full blown studio, I would make sure that I'm very well rested before going in there for one and two, very well practiced so that I can go in there and nail that. I can provide a personal story of doing vocals for a video game and having to fly to another state to record in a very well-respected engineer's studio. His name is John Rod. We got started with this particular project and I was three takes in on essentially triple tracking a lead vocal. So I did one track and nailed it. Did a second track to double it, nailed it. Working on the third track, nailed it. After the third track, he turns around and he's just like, what a pleasure it is to work with somebody that knows what they're doing. <laughs> and it's that's a high paid compliment from that guy. And I've really appreciated it. I understand where he's coming from, having worked with other vocalists. And the thing you have to be additionally aware of is being honest with yourself as a vocalist. If you're not nailing it and you can do another take, this is where a producer comes in handy or a vocal producer. Yeah, an extra, a producer set, of ears or a yeah, an extra yeah. set of ears to be there alongside the audio engineer who's doing the tracking and the vocalist doing the singing. The producer or the vocal producer, because it could be either or, can be there to say yay or nay on a take because they're yeah. supposed to keep that grand view. And this is why I find it problematic that people are trying to blur the line of producer in today's age of I do everything, but whatever it is. That being said, take notes. Understand if you're getting it to a point where it's workable. And at that point, even though we're saying this is a Band-Aid and a tool that you can use, that's where you have to make the decision. Are you close enough that the tool will be okay? And okay is not necessarily great in this day and age, but you can get by with it. Or do you take it further and do another take? Or wait another day? Yeah, I, I will always favor another take, right? If exactly. the singer is capable of doing it, actually. Now, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't necessarily encourage anybody to try to do vocally something that, that they're not capable of doing. You can probably come up with a better line to, to make it suit your voice better. One thing that you kind of touched on also that I think is really important is the emotion that is delivered. Yes. Right, for the vocals. So if there is a line where the emotion is just great. It's like, oh my God, that's that's awesome. But you were a little bit flat on the high C or whatever, mm -hmm. right? I would much rather have that and pull that note into pitch where it's going to be working as opposed to having a pitch perfect vocal that lacks emotion or emotion. Oh yeah, for sure. You know? I'm right there with you. I agree 100%. 
apart from that, I would agree with everything that you're saying. Like an extra take is always preferred sure. if, the, if the singer is able to deliver that. And the other thing too, in terms of taking another take and delivering, as I mentioned before, it's a really good idea to have a vocal producer or a producer of the overall track there to give feedback. And also somebody who's capable of giving feedback that can draw out that emotion if the emotion's not happening. Some people can't do that. They can just thumbs up, thumbs down something. But sure, yeah. You really be good, the psychologist every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. The really good vocal producer or a really good producer will be able to understand how to draw out the emotion of what should be coming out of it and explain that to the singer to get the singer to understand where to approach it from to get that emotion. All right. So let's say that we have all of these things. And before we go into talking about workflow, how to deal with this, the, what there's a lot of them out there, but what are some of your favorite tools that you use for this? Well, the first one that comes right off the top of my head because I own it is Melodyne from Celimony. Mm -hmm. And I know that you own it as well. Yep. There's one that everybody tends to know, and it's the verb, sort of like Xerox or Kleenex. It's Auto-Tune <laughs> by Antares. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. they are arguably the first pitch correction software that was heavily popular. And have, as I just mentioned, it has become the verb of the situation. Yeah, it's sort of like Photoshopping something. It's right, like, exactly. You know, yeah, you're auto-tuning something. Yeah. Then there's also another one that I have uh, in my arsenal called Repitch by Synchro Arts. And of course, how do you like that one? Its interface is less intuitive than Melodyne to me. To mm -hmm. me, Melodyne has the most intuitive interface. And that's okay. why I tend to go to that one like 99% of the time. Yeah. I'm with you there because I, I do a lot of heavy lifting with Melodyne. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's deep, you can do a lot with it. So that's my favorite. And even though that there are things that are available built in your DAW, right? There's pitch correction in, in Pro Tools and there's flex pitch and logic, right? I yes. tend to reach for, for Melodyne when I do it. And that's just become a part of my workflow because I've used Melodyne since I think probably version one. Wow. This point. That's quite a ways back. I, I, I think one or two. Yeah, I'm old. I'm not dating <laughs> myself. But, but, um, and there's another yeah. one from one of your favorite companies as well. It's uh, the Metatune and Metapitch from Slate Digital. Yeah, I am a big Slate fan. Those two are part of their bundle. I never use them, to be honest, okay. because I feel, well, I'll keep my feelings, you know, to the wayside <laughs> of that. But, but I, let's say I prefer Melodyne to that because of what I do. Right. I, I want my pitch correction to be as transparent as possible. Oh, okay. So you're kind of implying that those aren't. No, I'm not. I'm not saying they're not, but uh, oh, I'm gonna <laughs> say it anyway. So a lot of these things tend to be sort of like gimmicky to me. Ah, uh, gotcha. And it's sort of going for a certain audience and user base that mm -hmm. I am not a part of. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Another one that also comes off of my head because I know I've used it in the past is Waves Tune, and yeah. I thought. I feel their interface is clunky, which is why I stopped using it. I never tried the, what is it called? Just vocal tune or, or tune, waves tune or whatever. Yeah, just waves uh, tune. I don't have any experience with it. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, there's a million of these. I'm sure Cubase and all other doll will have some kind of functionality in there. Again, here, it's like use what you got, right? Both you and I prefer Melodyne because I think it can do so many things. And also the, the polyphonic thing, which we're oh, not yeah. really talking about today, no. but the different algorithms are fantastic in, in Melodyne. So that's where I go for as well. Very true. Now that we've named off a whole bunch of the popular tools that people can use to actually correct pitch for vocals, what is your workflow, your methodology? At this point, I tend to, of course, I'm like you, I always listen first. Mm -hmm. I tend to, whenever there's lead vocals that I'm working on, I tend to throw them in there right away with because it does ARA support now, so it's it's not a long, tedious process. You just kind of check it. Well, yeah, there it, is that. <laughs> you're right. In logic, so, you're you saying. Had, does yeah, Pro Tools yeah, have it now, too? I think Pro Tools does have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. 
Yeah, so it, it's integrated in a very similar manner with ARA and stuff. So I throw it in, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I just automatically go in and start tuning stuff. Right. But let's say that this is one of those cases there where I would want to tune it. I tend to not necessarily go for a 100% right in pitch straight away. Mm-hmm. I feel like if I do that, it can be a tendency of almost getting like this very sort of synthesized sound. Sure. Out of it when everything is like is really perfect. A lot of times the singer will do things that would kind of skirt around the pitch center or whatever. So I might go somewhere between like 80 to 90 percent and pulling that in tune right off the bat and see what that sounds like. Mm -hmm. That's where I start. But of course, when you're sitting with the interface of any kind of pitch correction, it's really easy to start listening with your eyes. Oh, of course. Right? So we're like, oh, look at that note. That, that looks like it's a little <laughs> bit flat, and this one's a little bit sharp. So, so we end up moving stuff that necessarily doesn't have to move, right? Yeah. That also means that you're as good as it is, but you're, you're then a slave to the algorithm that has analyzed the note. Right? Yes. And that, that's not always 100%. So I listen now. Right. Mm -hmm. And am I doing more good than harm? Is that that's the biggest thing, right? But that's where I start. What about you? Do you automatically go in? Let's say that it's somebody else that you're you're working with. Do you automatically just bring it into Melodyne or, or how do you do it? Well, now that there's ARA available in Logic and has been for a while, and of course it was co-developed between Apple and Celemony. So that's where that comes from, which is a great thing. The first thing I'm doing after I get the takes that I want is comping the vocal so that I have it as close to as where it needs to be as possible. Now, there have been singers in the past where I get all those takes, I comp it. I don't even need it, so I don't throw it down. So right, that's but that's not what we're talking about today. I know, so it's let's not assume what we're talking that you about. Get so some, some stuff, assuming yeah. that the comp vocal still has some areas where it needs some touch-up with pitch correction – possibly some timing correction, because all these pitch characters can generally do time corrections as well. Okay. Caveat, left-hand note here, or I just stopped you from going on that tirade, and now I'm going to go on another one. <laughs> <laughs> do you tend to do the timing correction in Melodyne, or do you do it in the DAW? That's a good question, and that is, is it depends mode. After I've got it in, comped, and I've thrown it on Melodyne, I'm going to listen and I'm not listening with my eyes. I'm listening with my ears to find out where something went out. Then when I find something that went out, I'm not going to use the auto correction because mm -hmm. I generally don't do the use auto tune no, you do type note things. By note. Uh -huh. I do it note by note, piece by piece by hand. And I will listen as I make that adjustment and play it back and listen again to make sure that I've nailed it. The idea where people say they can hear auto-tune, I think it has a lot to do with when somebody who is using these tools tends to just select all and say hit pitch 100%. center or yes. some, some variation thereof. And it makes it too obvious in that regard. Thus, I'm listening for the things that are only technically out and only touching those things that are technically out. And usually, hopefully, they're not out by far. As far as the timing thing goes, I will tend to do the lead line that is directing everything else, so to speak, by hand within Melodyne by grabbing the front end or the back end of whatever and shifting the pieces around into time because they do have a grid that you can look at in there and get it mm -hmm. and listen and get the feel and everything happening along with the pitch correction. Once you've done that, it's easier to bounce a version of that to a new track and now with logic having something similar to vocal line it's real easy to choose your main line and then star out the other tracks and say time correct to this right and then you're yeah. done unless you have to pitch correct all those then you have to bounce them as well being in time and then you pitch correct them afterwards so for backing things and other things that are doubled i will do the lead line first by hand and then i will do the alternates by correcting the timing then correcting the pitch mm. Okay. Yeah, because when it comes to the correction then, right, I'm mm -hmm. with you where the lee line is going to be king and everything else, whether it's doubled or whatever, is going to be adjusted according to the lead line. How hardcore do you get? Because 
I do a fair bit of of tuning of vocals with my current working situation I'm in. And I've trained my ears well enough. If it gets to within like 10 cents mm -hmm. of pitch center, it's very likely going to be okay, yeah. depending on the circumstances, of course, right? How close do you get to that, though, when you tune your vocal? It's, it's like, you, obviously, you're hearing it, and you got a good ear as well. So how I've far never would you allow it. something to be out? I've never looked at it down to the scent is, first off, the okay. way I would say that. I'm listening against the instruments that the vocal's going on, unless it's off in space by itself with no other instrumentation happening. You've got something else to reference. For me, against the reference of whatever the instrumentation is, it has to work there. If it's right. not but working let's say there, that then you have to maybe adjust differently. All right, but, but let's say that that other track is the main lead vocal now and you're working on the double. Mm -hmm. How far out would you, I'm assuming it's still just an ear thing for you when you're adjusting that to the lead vocal, how well it works, because quite often you don't want them to be 100% both because it, it's... Well, then it would sound it, abnormal. It'll right. sound like you're talking about synthesized at that point when you do that. It's nearly impossible. Is it possible for vocalists to sound that close to each other or the same vocalist to get that close to their own pitch? Yes. And I would posit that the example that I would give is Lenny Kravitz with Fly Away. I guarantee mm, yeah. he did hundreds of takes to get that gigantic chorus the way it is. And then they might have gone in and done some touch-up work here and there on the individual tracks. But that's him singing like the badass that he is, getting it that damn close. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I would look at it. You don't go 100% unless you want that synthesized sound. Right. Now, what about modulation and sort of vibrato? Because that, that's another thing, right? With all these tools, we can actually tame people's vibrato or exaggerate it, as mm -hmm. it were, yeah. these days. So is that something that's part of your workflow that you do at the same time? Or again, I'm assuming just when it's bothering you? Only when it's bothering me, and it's been very rare. There's been a couple of instances where I've worked with a vocalist who had a really uh, kind of thing going, and yeah, they, yeah. they couldn't undo it, and it was really, really distracting to getting a proper pitch and a proper feel out of the vocal for the song. That's really frustrating because flattening that out kind of takes some of the vibe away, but at the same time, leaving that in becomes horrendously distracting <laughs> it, it, it's obnoxious it yeah. Is obnoxious. yeah i know i feel the same with uh, guitar players when they have a over enthusiastic vibrato it's just like oh just it sounds like a fly in the room just like just get rid of that yeah have i I'm ever with you. added it though i have increased size on some here and there but it's a rare case it's not very often that i do it i'm with you I, i'm very much in the camp of i might tame something but I'm probably not going to exaggerate it because now I'm altering, in my opinion, too much of what the vocalist intended. Right. And yeah. that's not kind of cool. But again, if they're perhaps searching for the note a little bit extra and adding some more vibrato, it's a good idea to kind of dial that back a little bit. Mm -hmm. What about the transition between notes? I think that's something that people tend to ignore when they're working with their pitch correcting software because that's a dead giveaway to me when something has been just like you said i'll get tuned 100 percent and just yeah it's just 100 percent, and the notes go whoop, and there's, ooh, and yeah, just there's straight no down, slide you know? there's no normal right. human slide between a note yeah i i leave those in like i said yeah. i am working based on what's going on around the vocal and using my ear in terms of that and not using my eyes so much as more of an ear thing and you have to listen for that and some people like i said they're just select all 100 percent grid it whatever you'll get that kind of effect that's where that whole concept of the share or t-pain effect came from is somebody accidentally 100 percent auto-tuned something and the pitch being way off of where it should have been suddenly went wacky and it sounded interestingly different so that becomes a gimmick of how to use 100 percent auto-tuning 
but when you're trying to do it transparently, it doesn't work the same way that way. You have yeah. to be very conscious of that. You have to possibly cut the region that comes up in the pitch correction software to make sure that you're manipulating as little of that as possible so that it doesn't make that weird jump between notes. Yeah. If I work with automatic options in Salomone or, or Melodon, I should say, I tend to do it in chunks. Mm -hmm. I would probably never, never say never, right? But I would never do an entire song in one pass. Right. I might do like a verse or whatever, but there you go. Do you have any final thoughts on all this? Well, last question, just like once you've done with all of these edits that you do, mm -hmm. do you, you say you work in ARA and ceremony. So do you leave them there or do you comp them out or sort of commit them or bounce in place or use your terminology freely here? <laughs> the idea of once I've done the edits, because Logic is still the writing, tracking, editing DAW that I use, I then export the multi-tracks all from yeah. zero and they go to Luna where I don't have to touch any kind of tuning and time correction there. To answer that, I am exporting multi-tracks. Yeah, I do the same thing. Once I've done that with, before I obviously get to the mixing stage or whatever, I will have a clean track of the vocal now as I intended with those possible timing corrections and the nicely tuned vocal with that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very, very similar. We hinted at it earlier here, but it can be really misused mm -hmm. just like any other tool. We can just over tune things to where they sound unnatural. And it sounds sort of like high and mighty, but depending on the quality of the, the singer, yeah, it can sound like in tune, but it doesn't sound like a person singing it. Yeah. You know, so it, it can get abused. And sometimes that's a cool thing where it's like, like you mentioned, like the T-Pain thing or the share mm -hmm. thing. It's like, oh, that, that's cool. And then you can't get away from that sound for it. Well, but the reality is both of those people can actually sing. <laughs> oh, sure. It, but it's just a great example of something sort of becoming part of the scene where it's like sure. people start asking for that sound. Mm -hmm. Right. On a little bit more of a serious note, I think since this is so used all over the place, mm -hmm. I imagine this is giving a decline in sort of like live performance because either t I, depending on the artist, of yeah. course, part of it is like the crowd expects it to sound like that. And it also exposes the singer that can't do it in the studio. Or is having so a bad it, night live. Well, it could be always that, but yeah. that's why I think a lot of times you end up with backing tracks and things like that just mm -hmm. to sort of keep the illusion alive it's not unheard of people get busted for it all the time sure yeah <laughs> so pitch correction i don't know are you going to use it for good or evil i guess that that's up to you but it's a good tool <laughs> if you use it be careful with how you're using it with that let's move on to our ferrari D finds chris what have you got this week this is something i mentioned before but i used it again this week and every time i do it's like oh such a joy <laughs> when you do repetitive tasks. There's a, there's a piece of software called Keyboard Maestro. Mm -hmm. Depending on how you set it up and what you want it to do, it just takes out menial tasks. Let's say that you're renaming tracks. It can do all of that for you if you set it up to a certain way. Sweet. And when you're doing that a lot, you're going to really like just leaning back, hitting your function key or whatever, and then boom, does it for you. So Keyboard Maestro is from a company called Stairway Software. That is, again, my find for this Friday. What about you, Jody? I'm going with something that I saw a couple of Thursdays ago while I was down in the Burbank area. And that is Austrian Audio is the phoenix that has risen up out of AKG. Ah. And it was a bunch of the guys that used to work for AKG. They started Austrian Audio. And they're now showcasing a new line of mics that have been around for a little bit, a year or two anyway. You One told of them, me about this. Yeah. Yes, I did. It was quite amazing to see these things in person, in hand, and listen to some firsthand experiences of those who have used them in our field of audio. I'm going to actually mention the OC818. It is supposed to be the next generation of the 414. The reason why I'm mentioning this is that the 414 is considered one of the 
penultimate mics to actually have. It is a large diaphragm condenser for those that don't know. And that's the same thing with the OC818. It's a large diaphragm condenser microphone. It has multiple directional capabilities in terms of how you can set it up from cardioid to omni and all the way in between with all these different kinds of switches. The really cool thing about this that makes it absolutely phenomenal is the software that you can get to go with this. Now you've heard about mic modeling type things. Absolutely. Yep. This thing can do something slightly different. It can change the polar pattern and the directionality of where you're listening to it from using the software. That's cool. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Who thought you could do this in post, but it can be done. Yeah, if you, you did have... mention that. It's, a, it's after the fact. After the but, fact. Yeah. It is a post-production type thing. Say that someone's lav mic goes out, but you have the 818 out there grabbing audio. And it's grabbing everything in general with the room. Maybe you've got it set up close to an Omni. But suddenly you just need that person's audio because the lav mic went out or something. You can change the polar pattern and the directionality of where that thing was getting and get that person without all the room sound if you need to. It's yeah, that's, crazy. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> it is yeah. crazy. So that is my pick for this Friday Find. Awesome. While we've got your attention, we ask that you go to InsideTheRecordingStudio.com and sign up for our mailing list. You'll need to be on our email list in order to be eligible for any future giveaways. And we'll make sure you don't miss any episodes of this incredible podcast. Send us an email at goldstar, G-O-L-D-S-T-A-R, at InsideTheRecordingStudio.com with the word pitch. And you'll get something cool back in your inbox. With that, I'll say see you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one, Jody.